Vamos a ver. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, welcome to Hong Kong. Welcome to the FDI 100th Anniversary Congress. Um, we have in the audience representatives from the local media, from the lay press and special requests. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, for this press event, which will be the um, presentation of the Vision 2020 document issued by FDI during this Congress, we have a panel uh, consisting of Professor Michael Glick, from Buffalo University. He is a chair of the Vision 2020 task team. Dr. Orlando Montero da Silva from Portugal, the FDI president. Dr. Tao Chu from Beijing University, who was also a member of the Vision 2020 task team. Stanley Bergman, who is the chairman and CEO of Energy New York. And Analia Mendes, who is global director of the Healthcare Program in Partnership for Oil Care and Unilever. Thank you very much for your time, for taking the opportunity to meet with the media. Michael, I'll leave you the floor if you want to introduce. Thank you. Much. And again, my welcome as well. Thank you for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, very quickly, I'm just going to take you through what we did in the task team for Division 2020. The task team members, you can see listed over here, I put them in alphabetical order. That's why my name is first. It has nothing to do with importance here. Uh, Mr. Steve Kess, Dr. Gilberto Puca from Brazil, Gerard Seberger from Italy, Orlando Monteiro da Silva, President of FDI, David Williams uh, from United Kingdom, and Professor Tao Chu from uh, Peking University in Beijing. And we had support here from our Executive Director at FDI, Jean-Luc uh, here, and Ms. Tanya Severin. The charge was very simple. Uh, in very few words, we wouldn't want to look at uh, threats and opportunities to our profession in the near future. So identify challenges and opportunities facing dentistry in the next decade, develop a long-term vision for our health and the dental profession as a whole, as well as identify important regulatory, legislative and advocacy challenges and opportunities. The document is meant to highlight issues of importance to all our health professionals and other stakeholders outline a vision that would inspire and influence the workings and advocacy of the World Dental Federation, FDI, and lastly, provide a foundation for developing local and global strategies. On purpose, we created this as a map, not as a roadmap, meaning we are facing problems and opportunities and challenges, and this document will be the springboard in order to create the strategies that will be both global, but more importantly, local strategies. So the areas of priorities, these are the five areas of priorities that we focused on. Meet increasing need and demand for our healthcare. Expand the role of existing our healthcare professionals. Shape a responsive educational model. Mitigate the impacts of socioeconomic dynamics and foster fundamental and translational research and technology. And with that, I will stop my remarks. Uh, that will give you the background, why we did it, and uh, the results of this very intensive uh, project that was given to, to us uh, to achieve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael Glick. Um, the next speaker is Orlando uh, Montero da Silva, who is a president of FBI, who will focus on specific aspects of the Vision 2020 document, collaboration and education. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all council members, members of the press. Let me, uh, before beginning properly, describe you a little bit about the FDI. The FDI is a federation of national dental associations, about 140 from all over the world, and about uh, 60 specialist groups, from science to research between others. We represent more than one million dentists worldwide. Our mission is to promote optimal oral health for peoples all around the globe. As though this, this document fulfills this mission of FDI, to anticipate the future, the future to, in a way, to reflect more than that, to try to influence what is happening in the profession and in oral health on the benefit of better oral health, optimal oral health, as I said, for all peoples. 
These five areas are very important areas and very much linked among, among them. We gave special emphasis on the document on uh, coming out of some isolation that uh, dental medicine uh, uh, is merged all over the world, collaborating more with other health professionals and with other non-health professionals in an interdisciplinary approach that these five areas focus, if you read the document in detail, and this executive summary, uh, this will be, it will, is very much focused on the document. I would say that the main issue of this document is for one's viewing oral health, not just as something aesthetic or something optional, but as a right, I would say, as a fundamental right for peoples, for the populations all around the globe. Thank you very much, uh, Orlando Monteiro da Silva. Um, the next speaker is uh, Professor uh, Dr. Tao Tzu from Peking University, who was also a member of the task team. And um, I would suggest that we um, you store your questions and keep them till the end. We'll have the flow of the speakers and afterwards, if you have questions, you can come back. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, just like uh, uh, Dr. De Silva pointed out, uh, that we should anticipate for the future as a dental profession, as, especially as an educator, anticipation uh, for the future is very important. For education point of view, we prepare talent for the future. We prepare talent for what we need now. With the economical condition uh, changes, with the people's awareness uh, for the oral health, and also because the population aging and etc. Together, uh, increase the demand for uh, dental uh, oral health professionals. So education uh, plays a very important uh, uh, part for this uh, Vision 2020. And also, we should recognize that uh, and prepare the future dental profession where we see more uh, uh, dentists uh, stay in the uh, rich area or the urban area where less really go to the place need a dental profession. This is uh, from educational point of view, we need to um, uh, start it in the early stage and edu through education, through a dental teamwork, and also work working with other uh, part of the oral health professions, like uh, dental nurses, accelerators, etc., to really help to improve the quality of life and help uh, for the anticipate for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tu. Now, the next speaker, we had three speakers who are from the task team. The next two speakers are from the industry, and they will talk a little bit about interpretation of what the contents of Vision 2020 are. The first of these speakers is uh, Stanley Bergman, who is chairman and CEO of Henry Schein Incorporated. Good afternoon. Uh, Henry Schein, uh, my company, is the largest provider of healthcare products to uh, physicians, to dentists, and to veterinarians. Um, and therefore, we have a role both in the physician world, in the medical world, and in the dental world. Um, of course, it's great to be here on the 100th anniversary of the FDI. And we congratulate you on that. Um, I had the honor of participating uh, several years ago in the American Dental Association's Future Dentistry Project. Uh, this uh, was a report that the American Dental Association commissioned about eight years ago, nine years ago, and projected out the future of where dentistry would uh, be heading. And uh, while sitting in that, and I was the only industry person, in sitting in the proceedings and the dialogue that took place around the table, it became more and more clear to me uh, uh, and to my company that oral health is an essential component of good health and that more emphasis needs to be placed on preventative care in the oral health care setting, just like in the human uh, uh, arena. And I would submit to you today that the way to deal with the challenges facing oral care and advancing oral care in general as part of the continuum of health care uh, can really only be solved and dealt with through public-private partnerships. 
And in the public-private partnership arena, in the dental area, the public-private partnership needs to take into account the views of the dentists, and of course the FDI is the uh, global dental uh, representative, but the educated as well, educators as well, My, uh, Professor Glick comes from that world as well, and of course governments, the NGOs, the non-government uh, organizations, and uh, the private sector. And I think the FDI report, this report of 2020, uh, I think is the down payment in dentistry, is the uh, global uh, vision for how to bring the public-private partnership into bearing in a way that could ultimately make a difference. Now, I, I think it is a visionary report, and like with all visionary reports, is aspirational. But it takes uh, a courageous group of people, as this group uh, uh, really uh, uh, working together, uh, ultimately uh, 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 proposed a vision that uh, perhaps is a little bit far-fetched, but you cannot really begin uh, executing on a vision unless you actually have the vision. And in this particular case, I think the vision is set, and it's now time to take some steps forward in advancing the findings of this commission and I would advocate that the FDI would be a great organization for the public-private partnership to come together to advance the aspirations of what these uh, commissioners uh, have put together when they developed their findings. Thank you very much, Stanley Bergman. I'd now like to present to our final speaker, who is Dr. Annalia Mendes, who is a Global Director of Health Programs and Partnerships for Oral Care and Household Care Categories in Unilever. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to try to not to repeat uh, what my colleague from Harry Shines, uh, but congratulations, FDI, for the 100th anniversary. Um, we all know that the burden of, of oral disease is too high. Um, as a dentist myself, I have been frustrated by the lack of attention and priority given to oral health by individuals, by governments, and, and global medical bodies. With the publication of the FDI's vision for the future of the industry, I have high hopes that change will be accelerated and that the next eight years will see significant improvement in oral health around the world. As you have read, the vision uh, focuses on tackling oral health inequalities, shifting towards a greater emphasis on prevention and oral health promotion over uh, mainly curative approach. Education is a theme that comes up time and time again in the vision, along with the notion of collaboration with key stakeholders within the community and the broader oral health uh, healthcare system. What is laid out in this vision, and what I like a lot, is a new era for dentistry and for oral health. It's truly inspirational, as is true, and highlighted by my colleague. At the very heart sits the premise that good oral health is essential component of general health and basic human right for all and not privilege of a few. At Unilever, uh, we believe that business has a responsibility, an important role to play, helping to ease these problems of the communities in which we operate. Oral disease prevention and promotion of good oral health behavior stretched from our research and development to the toothbrushes, toothpaste, mouthwashes we produce in China under the brand of Shonghua, and to the unique partnership we have with the FDI, Live and Love, to our own Unilever oral care behavior change programs that encourage children and their families all over the world to brush day and night. Two years ago, at Unilever, we announced our sustainable living plan, which is really aligned with the vision of FDI our roadmap to sustainable business growth, including a pledge to help more than a million people take action to improve their health and well-being. This includes a specific commitment to change oral health care behavior of 50 million people for better, uh, for better oral health by 2020. So the vision of FDI and through this vision, is it clear that the FDI and the dental professionals working together with key stakeholders and partners like Unilever or Harry Shines will be well equipped to lead the world to optimal oral health. And we will be proud to walk the, the, with you 
to support you every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anna Mendes. Uh, before I uh, put the uh, questions to the floor, there's perhaps a question I would like to ask the, the, the panel in general. It's that um, health has become a huge issue, the issue of non-communicable diseases, and uh, all health has been included in that particular issue of uh, non-communicable diseases. It's become so important that last year there was a summit in New York about it. And what I'd like to ask the panel is, we talk about a crisis, how bad is this crisis? in oral health in general. What, are, what, are, what, are the, what sort of level of crisis are we talking about? Would somebody on the panel like to answer that question? Maybe I can begin uh, with that burden. Uh, and I will focus on, on the beginning on oral health. Uh, all over the world, nine in 10 people, nine in 10 people perhaps in this room suffer from either one or two of two, these diseases, tooth decay, and periodontal diseases. This is the burden that we have all over the world. And uh, uh, these two chronic diseases with an infection component are recognized on that declaration you mentioned very well. This declaration that for the second time addressed from the United Nations uh, health topic, chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases. And it was recognized that, that our health shares exactly the same risk factors and social determinants as the main four chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and respiratory diseases. We knew that for many years, but having that recognized is an additional and tremendous responsibility for the profession. And let me highlight you that the, the dentists all over the world, they are the unique persons in position to lead this vision that we have here in front of us. We as dentists, we have to take leadership to shape this future in these next eight years. And we'll do that. We'll do that in FTI, the longest term, not just in FTI, because our mission is to confederate others, the populations, the media, and this superior objective on the benefit of public health. And just before again, because you raised another issue there, is that um, one specific aspect, because we talk about things like world hunger, but is it true, the panelists, that in fact nutrition, oral health and nutrition, are two things that are closely associated together? Is it something that we can... Absolutely. Uh, if you cannot chew, you cannot eat. If you cannot swallow, you cannot eat. If you cannot use your mouth, uh, you have issues. Uh, people don't think about the mouth as something very important. Uh, unfortunately, in medical school, uh, they use the mouth as an entry into the body. In dentistry, we look at it as a mirror or what happens in the body instead. We also see that patients that suffer from uh, severe tooth decay as well as periodontal disease, uh, they will suffer eventually from malnutrition and other systemic diseases as well. So nutrition is just one of the component of it. Uh, as was mentioned here before, the risk factors for many of the chronic diseases here are associated with what we find inside our cavity. And as healthcare professionals, and dentists are healthcare professionals, as healthcare professionals, we have a responsibility not only for the oral cavity, but also for the overall health and well-being of our patients. And that's a responsibility that we, that we share with other healthcare professionals, and we think it's important. And that's also being reflected in the Vision 2020 that we have, you have here before you. Okay, um, I think we've answered that. One final one that I'm doing, and then I hand it to the floor. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, collaboration. We talked about collaboration with the industry. Um, we've talked a little bit. Could we explain a little bit more what it means collaborating with other members of the uh, medical profession in this issue of collaborative practice that we've talked about? How will that uh, improve things, and how will it? Collaboration. I can continue. <laughs> no, okay. Well, in uh, at Unilever, we have uh, four, four different um, categories, different partnerships with different organizations. As you know, we partner with Save the Children, UNICEF, Fox Fund, uh, BSI. Um, and 
this collaborate, we know that there is not a single issue in, uh, in health uh, that it can be tackled from one only angle and by on one only organization. And uh, we really believe by doing you know, partnerships and in partnership we can achieve more that we can do in, uh, as you know, one uh, only body. Uh, we have started a partnership with FDI in 2004 and we have proved, or proven all over these years, that we can do uh, a lot to improve our health. So why not in this vision as well to have, uh, I think it's a good decision for FDI to have partnerships uh, along the way to realize this vision. Let me ask, let me ask <coughs> that one more thing, sorry. And that is that if you look at healthcare professionals all over the world, take Tanzania as an example, where you have one dentist per 185,000 patients. They need our healthcare, but it's also a reflection of healthcare as a whole in a country such as Tanzania. So could the dentist do more than just oral health? Uh, we see in more developing words where dentist is the one to see the patient more often than a physician. Can a dentist do more than this? Can a dentist check for diabetes and cholesterol and doing cancer screening and diabetic screening? Yes, we can. So that's expanding the role of the dentist. And that's something we're exploring right now. But unless we expand the role of healthcare professionals, uh, we will not be able to serve our patients right, unfortunately. I think that those five areas of priorities, putting them up there is something that, that is quite brave because um, um, it's a very, very large um, scope of focus. Um, having said that, uh, Dr. De Silva, I, I would submit to you today that the FDI is really the only organization in the world that has the ability to convene all the stakeholders in dentistry, and by all the stakeholders in dentistry, it's not only the international uh, dental associations, country associations, but it's all the specialty associations and all those in healthcare that care about oral care. And um, there's been a lot of talk. I think the United Nations program on uh, NCDs has been a, a very important step forward, but I fear that dentistry is going to get lost. And I think that the only organization that really represents all the dental constituents globally is the FDI. And it's in that context that my company is very interested, and I assume Unilever, otherwise uh, you would not be here, in finding the right format to provide the public-private partnership to advance uh, the FDI's mission of access to care, and in fact dealing with uh, oral care as one of the uh, non-communicable diseases. And so, there, if it's, the FDI is not going to do it, no one else will. And uh, I'm not a public health dentist, so I can't calibrate for you exactly how many people suffer. But if it's eight or nine uh, people, uh, you know, per, uh, per 10 or whatever, 10% of the world's population, or whatever it is, forget the numbers. The point is, it's very severe. And you have the responsibility at FDI to rally the troops. And it's only going to happen through public partner partnerships. <clears throat> there's enough in industry that want to help you. Fully agree with you. Fully agree with you. Stand. It's, it's exactly like that. The WHO, with, with whom the, the FDI has official relations, is, stresses the same. Stresses that the health issues at the global scale, at the national scale, health systems are so complicated, namely in terms of financing, that they need really uh, this, uh, the needs and the demands that exist all over China. Recently, two other examples I had the opportunity to share in anticipation this part of this vision with, in two different realities. In Brazil, where the Brazilian government has a huge public oral health program all over the country, not just in rural areas but also in urban areas calling Smiling Brazil, Brazil sorry that. It is a huge collaboration example between health professionals at different levels. And it's working. It's getting for more than 80 million persons, it's perhaps the hugest public health program that is being launched at this time at the world level. It's providing basic oral health care for these 80 millions. The other experience was with young dentists in a 
huge meeting of young dentists because they will be at the end implementing or helping to implement this vision, this new paradigm of the profession that I stress for you again and uh, the leadership of dentists. Thank you. <laughs> if I may add, I mean, it wasn't great yesterday on the, on the, on the open ceremony that uh, the general director of WHO have uh, recognized FDI for the Little Love Partnership uh, with Unilever, which is recognition from the very top that the only way forward <coughs> is working in partnerships. And I completely agree with you when you highlighted the, all over your, your speech that private, private, uh, public partnerships is the way forward and the recognition of the organization of the limitations as well. Because dentists can do a lot, and uh, that's what the FDI is representing, but also recognizing that you need a partner to go to that place that a dentist cannot get, and that we can arrive and get this geographical coverage uh, with the products that we, we produce. So I, th I think that that is uh, admirable from FDI, that is chosen very carefully partners to go the way with the vision. Okay, uh, you've heard enough of my questions. Um, questions from the floor. I think that they raised a lot of uh, issues. Uh, there may be some things that are not clear to you. So if there are some things that you'd like more precision on or you'd like to add some comments, uh, perhaps you'd like to, uh, to uh, ask some questions now. Seems to me that you must have explained things very, very well, panel. Are you sure there are no <laughs> aspects that you particularly want to, uh, to follow up on? Maybe I'll ask a quick question. Um, for any of the panelists, can you maybe talk about the, and I know that a lot of this vision focuses on developing uh, countries, so just talk about the difference, uh, really an access level between uh, developing countries and uh, more developed ones. Okay, I can begin a little bit by that, but maybe some of the, it's not usual, maybe after some of the journalists could also get some feedback, but all our uh, information, we know that there are big disparities, inequalities between countries, between regions, but also inside countries. In all countries there are huge disparities, and that needs to be addressed, these social determinants, these issues that are not directly related with health, but affect a lot the health outcomes and the health gains of populations. I'm sure that happens here in Hong Kong, in China, as it happens in my country, in Portugal, in Brazil, in the US, or wherever country. And this is a tremendous challenge. It's not anymore a challenge between countries or between regions. This is an overall challenge that we have in front of us. And once again here, I think the document gives some leads for a future action on, on these issues. Yeah, let me just add one more thing to that. <clears throat> we talk about access issues all the time. And uh, yes, there could be countries where access is a, is a problem. But what we also highlight in this vision is the utilization of our healthcare. Uh, we may have enough healthcare professionals, but do the, our patients understand the necessity of our healthcare and do they utilize this our healthcare professionals where they are? And the answer is no, not enough. So our health literacy is something that we need to focus on in order to actually utilize the, our healthcare, the existing our healthcare professionals that they are to already. Only after that can we probably start to talk about access issues. But utilization is probably the primary focus right now more than anything else in most countries. Uh, uh, to, there's a question I'd like to address particularly to you, which is uh, that you come from China, from Peking University. Is It's an immense country with access at various levels at different parts of the country. Uh, what is in Vision 2020? How You were part of the task team. How does that inspire you in terms of looking at future policy and whatever in China? Could you? Well, um, thank you. Um, just like uh, Dr. Gleek just mentioned, the access um, is an issue. Uh, for instance, uh, in China, back to the 1949, when the new republic established, it's only uh, based on the statistics, it's uh, like five, 500 uh, uh, dentists and over uh, uh, more than uh, 450 million 
population. And now the situation changed uh, quite a lot. We have over a million uh, dentists. Uh, so it's like one dentist per 8,000 uh, population. That's it's really a, a significant progress. However, if you look at the, the overall uh, uh, population, it's still uh, fairly uh, uh, small. And uh, um, people tend, to, or the dental profession tend to stay in the uh, urban area rather than go to the rural area. And for the uh, past 20 some years, uh, Chinese government from uh, the governmental level, from uh, the uh, provincial level, and also the city level launched so many program, uh, programs and also uh, support the developing, developing areas. But still, there is a, a big demand for the uh, appropriate dental care uh, to reduce, uh, increase the uh, awareness of uh, uh, dental health. So just back to your question, uh, as you can see, China, after 30 years of economical reform, there's a significant changes. Everybody can see it. But you compare to the population, you compare to the specific area we are talking about, the dental health, there's still a, a demand for that. So the Vision 2020 really not address uh, what in China is basically the overall uh, need for the dental profession now to play a significant role in terms of uh, produce a, a better dental health to improve the quality of life and to, to be an important part of the society. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to throw the questions open again. Thank you. Uh, my question is that this public-private partnership that you my question is that this public-private partnership that you uh, talked about, should it be initiated through the national uh, associations or can somebody who's working in a private sector approach FDI for uh, you know, oral health program or something? Well, it depends on the context. In my view, national dental associations and most of all dentists are very well located to have the, this initiative at different levels, at public health level, at community level, and at individual level, that was what you were mentioning. We have very different experience, uh, experiences of this kind of public-private partnerships. We mentioned here some of them uh, all over the world. So the responsibility is a collective responsibility. Uh, also, the media there, you have their own, your own responsibility on this issue to promote, to raise awareness of. Uh, I could describe you very different approaches in terms of this, uh, the possibilities for these public and private uh, partnerships. Some of them are completely different from, from others. But the, the, the final goal is, of course, to promote oral health to invest more in education, in prevention, in, of course, treatment and rehabilitation, and in the supervision of dentists, included in a, a team with other health professionals and non-health professionals. Another question here, yes. Yes, I'm uh, Claudio Fernandes from Brazil. I'd like to uh, welcome the work of FDI, and uh, this is a very important document for professionals as a whole. And I would like to hear from the panel what are the measures that have been thought of at this point to consider the importance of dentistry to join actions on the sustainable development issues and green economy. Uh, we, on purpose, did not come up with strategies in this document. And the reason being that we recognize that although there are commonalities among many, if not all, countries. Uh, the strategies and how to tackle those strategies can be very different from in the United States, Germany, Japan, Tanzania, Kenya, and so on and so forth. So therefore, we avoided uh, getting into strategies. Uh, my uh, understanding is, and my wishes, and I hope that we will continue this work. This is, uh, this is a work in progress. It's a living document that's going to be able to address issues that are going to come up in the future. If these are issues that are going to come up in the future, we will address them. Uh, the next step is going to be to develop these strategies, but they're going to be local strategies appropriate for each and different countries. And that's what we're looking forward to for the next steps. 
Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. I noticed in the um, press release that um, saying that um, rising wealth leads to um, increased incidence of oral diseases. Uh, just want to ask what are the reasons for this and what's the situation in Hong Kong and China? <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, could you repeat the question you said somewhere in the press release? says, um, it's in the second page, saying um, that uh, this um, Congress highlights uh, the increased incidences, increased incidence of oral disease in Asia, where rising wealth creates the conditions that often lead to increased oral disease. Uh, uh, well, I think we should, uh, I think as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the uh, aging population increase, there's clearly a uh, demand for uh, uh, treatment, for clinical service. And also, uh, with the economical growth, which is a good thing, it changes the quality of life. However, because the people have more sugar consumption, so there's a, a significant factor to contribute the uh, carriers, the decayed uh, tooth, which actually is a bad thing. And also, uh, with the economical condition changes, uh, people's awareness to oral health and demand for oral health and uh, a better smile um, um, is a part of the social appearance. All those together contribute as a multi-factor to, to increase the, the demand for, for dental uh, service. That's how I think at the beginning I, I mentioned as a factor why we need to have a, a better or even a more education uh, resources to uh, fit the need for now and fit the need for the future. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? Yes, please. Yes, please go ahead. Can I ask a quick question for the panel? Uh, what type of uh, responsive education are you addressing for the future? Can you give a little bit of description of uh, this type of education? Thank you. Education? Education? Go for it. Um, well, I guess it's come to me again. Um, <laughs> we, we, we're talking about uh, the responsive um, education. Responsive education. I, I think if you translate into Chinese, it's very difficult. But if we, if we, like, we, we look at it from different angles, just like that young lady pointed out that there's a demand. When there's a demand, you need to fix it. Do something to uh, complete the task to, to, to help the demand. So this is a responsive. On, on the other hand, while you're doing things, there's certain responsibility. Just to give you another one, there's a fire, you need to put the fire out. This is a response. Or you go there to put the fire out, that's a responsibility. I think the education model, the responsive education model we mentioned in the Vision 2020 basically means that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You wanted to make a comment. At least, I, I just wanted to follow up on the gentleman who was asking whether it's uh, local or, or, or global. And um, I think there's a lot of work being done by uh, public-private partnerships in specific countries. So for example, in the United States, uh, the American Dental Association has Give Kids a Smile, which has been a very, very successful program uh, involving treating something like uh, uh, seven or 800,000 <coughs> children each year uh, uh, through dental volunteers and the private sector providing the products and the locations and the logistics. I mean, and I think there are many of those programs around the world. There are different kinds of groups that uh, will raise funds in the developed world, go and undertake uh, particular procedures in the developing world or even within the developed world. Uh, I think the area of gap, the area where uh, there's a huge need, is in the area of multilateral uh, collaboration in the area of solving any one of those items there. And I think the FDI is really the only organization that has uh, the moral uh, pulpit to uh, convene groups from, uh, whether it's regions or 
uh, different parts of the north was uh, bringing help to the south, etc. And uh, I would submit that um, there is a lot of work going on at the local level, more has to get done, but there is no one really undertaking global multilateral work. And I think the FDI has a, a, a responsibility to quote the professor to undertake that. Um, Thank you. Yes, please. My, my question was, you know, I'm from Dental News Pakistan and we organize World Oral Health Day in Pakistan and we do it with the local association. But all the work, whether it is uh, free dental checkups and things like that, that we organize on our own. We hardly get any support, any kind of financial support from anybody or, you see, with FDI, the advantage was that, you know, you could, could, uh, you could get a lot of literature for, to educate the masses. We could translate it into, uh, into Urdu and then go about it. But we did approach them, but we didn't get it. So it was kind of, uh, that's why I wanted to know how the public-private partnership works. Well, I think the FDI needs a more active foundation. <laughs> Probably Maybe, Maybe uh, our, we have a, an advocating role, a political role, if you prefer on addressing governments, on addressing NGOs, foundations, on addressing the private sector to engage everyone on that kind of proposal. And we have been very successful in this latest year. Let me just remind you uh, a declaration from uh, the World Health Organization where uh, FDI was very much involved uh, stressing for the uh, need to insert oral health into the health systems all over the world. And some steps have, have been taken in, in, in some countries. It's up also to all of us, to the society, to the literacy, to demand that from governments so that uh, oral health is seen, and I would repeat like in the beginning, as a fundamental human right. This is the role of FDI, is to promote oral health shifting with the aid of this document, shifting for this perspective as oral health as a fundamental human right. Thank you. Well, I think that now we can say that we've covered most of the areas, so um, I'd like to thank our panel members very, very much. It's a very busy, busy schedule in Hong Kong, so they've uh, taken time out to come here and talk to you today. Um, they will be available for maybe a few minutes afterwards if any of you have any specific questions that you would like to address to one single panelist, okay? Um, but thank you very much for your thank time you. today. Thank you. Thank you.